because I left mine. And, oh, is the microphone on okay? <laughs> Can't, don't have my hearing aids. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have heard of Wonder Woman. You know, comic books, television, and we know it's a fictional person, but today we have the real Wonder Woman, and I'm going to tell you why. Graduate of OSU in political science, all political science majors want to go. She did eight years in Washington, D.C. First as a uh, chief of staff of a congressman, and then later uh, as a uh, lobbyist. Is that fair to say, Susan? <laughs> no, that's what she said. Is a lobbyist uh, for a federated business enterprise. The lure to come back to Tulsa, which is her hometown, uh, where she served seven years with the uh, Tulsa, no, Business uh, Association, and then following that, she took a little break and uh, to start her family, and then came back in and was uh, involved with the city of Tulsa uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, her talent became very obvious to uh, Kathy Taylor when she was mayor and appointed Susan as the director of the community affairs, uh, and then that was continued on with uh, Dewey Bartlett when, when, he was, uh, when he was mayor of Tulsa. Uh, those sort of responsibilities caught the eye of uh, the University of Tulsa, and in uh, 2010, she was brought on board as a vice president with responsibility for community uh, relations, uh, research, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And those talents then w became very uh, re recognized by the University of Tulsa. And in 2017, she was brought on board as the executive director of Gilcrease Museum. What an awesome responsibility. Uh, she was responsible during this period of time uh, for the building of the Hemrick uh, uh, Research in American Studies and uh, now has taken on the responsibility of tearing down a building and building a new building, among the other things that she's been involved with. Um, her husband Rick, uh, they're proud parents of two boys, Joe and Jack, I think. So join me in welcoming Susan Neal. Well, I'll just say good morning again. <laughs> and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I was just saying that Gilcrease has, like no other museum in the country, a collection uh, that that boasts what Gilcrease has. It is the largest collection of Americana privately amassed by a single individual outside of the federal government, which would be the Smithsonian. And it's right here in Tulsa. I think in the 70s, it might have been more visible in the community, the 70s and 80s, but the city has never been in a position as a municipally owned museum it's never been in a position to be marketed at the national level like it should be. As a major destination for not only Tulsans, but a major destination for people throughout our country. It boasts uh, a, collect a letter from Diego Columbus, uh, written in 1520, Christopher Columbus's son. He wrote that letter to the King Charles of Spain, imploring him to import uh, Africans to the West for slave labor. It was the first l letter, uh, the first introduction of the idea of bringing um, black people to this country for slavery. And to bookend it, 
we have the signed copy of the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln, one of the few existing copies of the Emancipation Proclamation. We have uh, articles of the Confederation, a signed copy of the Declaration of Independence that went to the King of Prussia, uh, asking for his blessing and support of our revolution, and Benjamin Franklin uh, took it, and you would think with his persuasive powers he would have been able to get the King of Prussia's support to continue to do trade with this fledgling democracy, but he turned him down. But we do have that, that document. Um, we also have countless treaties between this country as it's growing with Native American communities uh, throughout this continent, treaties with uh, other uh, countries that really tell the making of the North American continent. It's not just the story of the American West. We have the largest collection of um, Western art, and we're very proud of that. So we've shown a lot of that, and that's been the story that we think of when we think of Gilcrease, and we should be proud of that. But in the new museum, we are going to focus on not only the story of the West and the story of founding of the country, but the stories of all of the indigenous uh, populations that that um, collection can tell stories about. There are 39 tribes that were relocated to Oklahoma alone. Gilcrease probably has over 60% of its uh, collection uh, relative, related to indigenous populations from all across the continent. It covers a geography of Panama to Alaska and about 12,000 years of history. There's just so much there. And so we look at what made Thomas Gilcrease amass this collection. When he was 16, he became a millionaire pr pretty much overnight because of the Glen Pool and his allotment of land. Um, that he was given for, uh, as a member of the Muscogee Nation. When he started traveling and uh, becoming really well acquainted with Europe, and he fell in love with the idea of art informing a culture, that it preserves a culture, that it informs the future, and he loved history. So I think European art was too expensive for his taste, as an indigenous member uh, of the American community, he decided Americana would be his focus. And he began collecting American art and documents and anthropological uh, artifacts. And because of that, nearly 400,000 items sit there at 1400 um, North Gilcrease Museum Road, or they did until just recently, and you own them. I say you because we, as the city of Tulsa, own that collection. Um, it's what Thomas Gilcrease was challenged with. It's, it, that is a result of his challenge that he faced in the early 50s with his oil business. I think he went on one or two, three, maybe four, too many digs, <laughs> because his oil business, I think, was suffering a bit. And the way he needed to recoup some um, dollars to keep his collection and to not totally go bankrupt was to uh, sell the collection. And if you had a family of uh, art, which I think he looked at it that way, he did not want it separated. So he kept trying to keep this collection together. And Henry Aronson, uh, Aronson Auditorium downtown is named for Mr. Aronson, decided that there should be a bond issue uh, to see if Tulsa would pay uh, to front load uh, the amount that was owed on his debt, and then Mr. Gilcrease would deed the collection to the city of Tulsa. That happened, and in 1954, we took possession of the, what was the Gilcrease Museum, and one big gift, and then a second gift in 1961. He was very clear about what he was going to leave his children and what he wasn't going to leave his children. He said, I've given my children, in his last will and testament, he said, I've given my children everything they're going to receive, and if they 
ever try to ask for any of this art or the collection, um, they will not be given what I've allowed, what I've given them already. They will not get one dollar more. So he felt very strongly, I think he knew that his collection would be worth a lot and he wasn't wanting it to be sold off or separated. So Tulsa owns it, you own it, and it sits there and for the last 73 years in a building that I think we all have special memories of. I know I did or do. I was married in that museum uh, 42 years ago in August. So I was particularly attached to Gilcrease um, for very personal reasons beyond the love of just that building. But just so you'll know, I'll, I'm going to back up and talk about the building so we all have the same information. Um, this is the project as it is currently uh, expected to be built, and this is what it's paid for. Um, you can see that, whoops, we are really just five minutes from downtown, five or seven minutes from downtown. And for the first time, we'll actually have a view of downtown from the front of the museum. This upper terrace, um, I don't have a pointer, so I'm using my finger. This upper terrace that you see off of the room that is on the top floor, that room that you're looking at there is the next iteration of the Vista Room. And so not only will it overlook the Osage Hills, it will overlook the beautiful uh, northern view to Stewart Park. And the terrace around it is a beautiful outdoor terrace. People have told us they wanted us to make sure that you could actually enjoy the outdoors as opposed to just look at it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But this is what um, is paid for. It's paid for by uh, you all, $65 million worth. The Tandy Foundation gave another $10 million. Then there was a combination of eight point three um, million dollars that we had from past projects that we did not complete because we knew they would get torn up. So we held on to that money. This is the project that the community would like to see. And we spent the last two and a half years as part of this process talking to people from all over our community, all walks of life, all ages, all types of organizations, and it didn't matter where they came from, how old they were, or what their background was, they wanted to see a much more engaged, much more engagement with this 460 acres that we sit on. And the public currently only really sees about 26 of those acres. The 460 or so that you're looking out over the Osage Hills when you were looking outside of the Vista Room, that land was amassed by the city of Tulsa and the Thomas, well, the Gilcrease Museum Association back in the 80s to protect the view shed and then to eventually support activities that would benefit Gilcrease Museum and the city of Tulsa. But it's just set there, right? And we've loved looking at it and it's beautiful but we haven't really been able to enjoy it the way I think people would like to today. So what you see in the foreground here is a, an outdoor amphitheater. And I don't know if any of you recall Will Smith in our community, but his trust has funded that outdoor amphitheater. So that too is, will be built as part of this project. What you see in the back is called the Night Garden and it is a sculpture garden, and um, we hope to have funding for that before we open, but currently it's not funded. Um, to the far end, or the south end, there is a, a big plaza area with, and underneath that is an education wing, and that education wing is not yet funded. When we were talking with the community, there were two major needs. The ability for Tulsa to enjoy these grounds and an education wing. There are not quality education uh, amenities and facilities like this in that part of our city. 
and we got a lot of input from the community that they particularly wanted to see that. So it's my goal to get that funded within the next year. So what I just talked to you about is about between the night garden, the education wing, and that plaza is about $15 million. So I just have about $15 million more dollars to raise, right? <laughs> so in addition, with the cost of um, materials, labor, and everything that you, maybe you and your businesses have been through and your families have been through over the last two, two and a half years, what was an $83.6 million project is a $104 million project, which is shocking, absolutely shocking. I guess there couldn't be a worse time to be trying to build something, uh, but it's, that's, that's what we've been dealt, and we've raised in the last eight months uh, that difference between 83.6 and 104. So we've raised about $25 million in this last year. And um, we'll continue to raise money for this project. It's, it is Tulsa's uh, cultural gym, and I think by the response that we get from the community who want to be involved and make sure that this is successful, uh, it's evident that Tulsa loves this project, so we're very excited about that. And uh, we'll talk about what is going to happen on the grounds again, again in a little bit. Um, so I would just like for you all to know why we had to take the building down. I think some people would say, there wasn't anything wrong with that building. I don't know why we're spending money on that. And that wasn't the plan to take down that building. The plan was to expand Gilcrease Museum. And then you get your architects in and they look at it and they say, do you realize there are five buildings in this building? And Maybe the city, because it's their building, was aware of that. And I've certainly been around Gilcrease Museum for a long time, but I don't think I was really aware that there were five buildings. This is the little carriage house that existed that was built in 1913, or actually what, was, what Mr. Gilcrease put around the little carriage house. It was just a stone garage, a sandstone garage. And rather than tear it down, he just kind of plastered over it, and that became the first museum and he expanded a little bit. And then in 1963, this building was added. And then in 1975, this portion was added. And then in 1987, this portion was added. And so what you have is that carriage house that lives within that original small inner green space and all of these additions. Not one of them today can perfor could perform to code for museum standards. So when the last, I've been there five years in August, and I can tell you that our HVAC, you know, I know more about HVAC systems than I ever wanted to know. But HVAC is absolutely fundamental to a successful museum and taking care of a collection. It has to have a range within the humidi a humidity range and a temperature range, and if you can't stay within that range, you are not taking care of what you own, and you cannot responsibly go and get other museums with fine art to loan to you, because they ask for a condition report, and you must give them what your previous three months were in order for them to commit to making a loan. So not only were we not able to take care of our most valuable asset, the Gilcrease collection, at least appropriately, we certainly weren't uh, going to get uh, very many more loans. Every summer and with every change of season over the last five years, I know we've been treading water. And when we did take um, the architectural team with engineers through the building, invariably some smart aleck <laughs> from some of the HVAC engineering teams would say, well, you know what belongs in a museum is your, your boilers and your heating units. Those are ancient. They, you know, no wonder you can't keep this building. Um, 
when you know that you aren't going to be able to do it when you can't even find replacement parts on eBay. So, because what you have is obsolete. So they recommended that we bring this building down, that taking your money, our money, as a public trust, and investing that money in this building would have been a terrible mistake and pouring good money after bad. So as hard a decision as that was, we decided to do that. Um, this is not what a gallery, this is just an early rendering of a gallery. I uh, hope that with, um, not in the not too distant future, we will be able to have online what they call a fly through, and you can actually go to the Gilcrease website and see what the galleries are going to look like on all the floors. It's just going to be beautiful. But this was an early rendering, and um, I, I didn't want to, the art and the, well, the collection are so important. Um, I didn't want you to think that we aren't thinking about the galleries, but I just don't have very many renderings of them yet. And again, I think you're just going to love the visitor experience. We are working with a company called Gallagher Design. They're based in Washington, D.C., New York, and Singapore. And they're an international firm working with museums all over the world for the galleries and the interpretive plan and the narratives and the development of the stories that we're going to tell. The um, other firm that we're working with to design the building is Smith Group. And they, too, are out of Washington, D.C., New York, Houston, a lot of big cities throughout our country they have offices in. But they have done, I think, their two most uh, important projects that they've done that you might have seen would be the National Museum of African American Art and Culture, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the National Museum of the American Indian, also a Smithsonian uh, museum in Washington, D.C. Again, I think we're in really good hands uh, with both of those uh, firms, and uh, we're working locally with a firm called One Architecture. What you are seeing here, though, is um, if you look in the lower Uh, right-hand corner here, that is Gil that's where Gilcrease Museum will be. Uh, the Thomas Gilcrease House, just to assure you, is staying, and the mausoleum, of course, is not going to be disrupted in any way. Um, but what we are building behind us is 14 miles of hiking and biking trails, mountain bike trails and hiking trails that will go all the length of that 460 acres. And uh, I think Turkey Mountain is about 15 miles, and so we're in that uh, vicinity of about the same a number with about 14 miles. There is a small pump track for children to learn bicycle riding. We wanted to do something that was not intrusive, high impact on the land, but to make it enjoyable for families and for people as a destination, and to add the museum with that uh, hiking and biking really makes this a much larger attraction. It, I'm sure many of you have been to Bentonville and seen Crystal Bridges and the number of trails that they have put in in northwest Arkansas. As they do that, they are counting their dollars because those trails are adding a great deal to the economic development of Northwest Arkansas. The first year that their first set of trails uh, were in place, uh, their city of Bentonville, we went over to see them, and they said they figured their economic, economic impact from those trails was about $130 million. So, the other reason that we wanted to do these trails was, that, again, there, there are not um, a lot of facilities in that northwest quadrant of our city. When I was with the city and oversaw um, the largest plan for uh, the update of our comprehensive plan, we did a lot of community engagement and community um, involvement with that effort as well. And I remember this number very well. 83% of Tulsa felt like that there was an underinvestment in that part of our city 
and that there weren't amenities sufficient to make that an attractive and healthy place. So this is something that we've worked on with the community. This is needed and um, not everybody gets to go to the gathering place. Um, so we feel very fortunate that the Williams companies have already funded these trails. And I just have to raise another 1.5 million <laughs> to uh, get the accompanying um, amenities, some utilities, a restroom, and a, a little pavilion funded, and we'll be ready to go by uh, the summer next year. This time next year, we, we should be able to begin. So we are partnering with Bike Club. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bike Club. They're an after-school program, and they're in over 30 schools in Tulsa Public Schools and in Sand Springs and in Union Public Schools. And it teaches citizenship, leadership. It also teaches them how to ride a bike safely. And um, they are given a helmet and a bike, and they are taken on bike rides with adults in after-school programming. And if you ever want to feel good about Tulsa, they have a meeting once a month, a little cookout at different places, with the, their volunteers, They'll go, the um, bike club volunteers who work in all of these after-school programs throughout the community. And if you want to feel good about what adults, caring adults can do for kids and the difference that they can make in their lives and in their health and in their attachment to school and their desire to want to go to school, which is what a good after-school program does, I'm a real fan of Bike Club because they really do a lot to make uh, our students uh, be engaged at school and healthier. So we'll be partnering with Bike Club on these trails. And I should have mentioned the topography for this area, it's kind of like a ski slope. It just worked out perfectly. The green the area closest to the museum is a um, the bunny slope. It's the most family-friendly and user-friendly for the young person learning to mountain bike. And it, just the way the topography works out, it gets more difficult as you go west. So it's th those are the blues. So it just worked out like it was meant to be. And the people who are building these trails are a company called Rogue Trails, and they are out of uh, Arkansas. But the owner has been spending so much time here with us. He's building trails all over Tulsa now. And he's moving to Tulsa. <laughs> so we're excited about that. Um, the, my goal really for uh, Gilcrease is that it be a destination for, we were put in an economic development package. And not unlike Bentonville or um, a museum that can boast these outdoor amenities, we should be able to really make this a significant attraction. One of the things that uh, we, INCOG, if any of you have worked with INCOG, they took, this was two or three, well now three or four years ago, they took some people, um, civic leadership, over to Bentonville to look at the trails. And several of them, said, well, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we had a museum that had some land and that we could do this? And several people scratched their head and said, well, you know what? We do. So they came home and talked to me, and it just took off from there. So, And then, we, like I said, we got a lot of community input saying, please make the grounds accessible for trails and hiking and outdoor use. So not only will we have an outdoor amphitheater and a sculpture garden as soon as I can get that funded, uh, but uh, the education wing, as soon as I can get that funded, will open up to the, that outdoor space. And so it really will be a very family-friendly environment. This is just an aerial of um, the whole site of the math with the master plan. Um, that's not what the gardens will look like up front. Uh, we're still working on that. That was just a concept drawing. But it does show the night garden, and then obviously the trails will be further to the um, 
west. I keep losing this. Sorry. How do the news people do it? Okay, they must have a bigger ear. Um, this is the uh, entry as planned. Um, again, just a concept for uh, a garden, but you can see up above the window that will uh, overlook downtown, and that is where the cafe will go. Uh, the water feature to the left is uh, funded, so we're happy about that. And as soon as you walk in, you can see what, you know, what, when you look straight ahead, what you're going to see is a, when you walk in and just keep going, this is a 36 feet, foot, <laughs> uh, tall window that overlooks the Osage Hills. And you will be able to walk out on that little balcony. One of the things that the collection is about is the land. And Thomas Gilcrease loved that location. He wouldn't have chosen it. But to have this beautiful land, like I say, five to seven minutes from downtown, and not be able to really engage with it, is, is we're really trying to change that. Plus, we're trying to make this as much a part of the art as possible. The art is, the collection is full of landscapes. The collection is full of documents that are all about the land. The land, the people, and how we get along. There are three major themes throughout the museum. It's really our changing America is the overarching theme. And uh, because this is the Thomas Gilcrease Institute of American History and Art. That's its official name. Uh, it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, so yes, we call it Gilcrease Museum. But that's its real name. And his commitment was to make it as much about education as it is about um, being a museum. He was really interested in attracting scholars and research. And we are emphasizing that with the Helmrich Center for American Research. And we have, like I said, lots of uh, vistas to the land. This will be the vista from the, that terrace that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, and like you can see, it overlooks the Osage Hills and uh, Stewart Park to the north. This is up a full level higher than the current vista room, so you'll really be above the tree line and be able to see a lot more. It'll probably be the most beautiful uh, vista in Tulsa. So that's the project, uh, the building. If I could just talk to you a little bit about the mission. I've mentioned economic development. I've mentioned being uh, available to and accessible to families and being able to um, really celebrate the land and the location, all of which is true. But I've also mentioned to you that over 60% of this collection is indigenous. We have had 35 consultation, 35 tribes that we are in consultations with because we have been showing objects from their collection without much guidance, uh, their, not their collection, their culture, excuse me, uh, without much guidance or input. And when we show objects that are now of, whether it's Choctaw or whichever tribe they rep it represents, their voices will be at our table. And we will include them in every step of the way. Uh, Thomas Gilcrease had a really interesting perspective. He had a foot in the business world, definitely in uh, the oil business, but he was very much uh, a Native American. He, you could tell in his writings, which we just now have been able to access. We have now, we, it's amazing. We found about 10 boxes of documents that belong to Thomas Gilcrease that have not been researched yet. And so I guess you should move every 10 years or so. Um, but this is the first time that we will have it, that much insight to him as a human being, as a business leader, as a member of the Muscogee, uh, just as a person and what he really was intending to accomplish. But what I have been privy to so far 
is he was a really conflicted person, just philosophically and uh, culturally, uh, trying to weave together both the white man and the native man's philosophies. And it was a struggle for him. But it was, it was really, it's, it's really going to be interesting to see what that collection holds. I think, though, what you will see when you come to Gilcrease is we are not going to rewrite history. Absolutely not. But we are going to tell more of it. And we are going to tell more of it with, um, through the culture and the art and the artifacts that we have within that collection. Uh, of, after 12,000 years of history, there's probably a lot more it can say and a lot more it can show us. Uh, but it will, I think, help us uh, live up to his vision that it be an institute for learning as much as it is a, a museum to come and enjoy, you know, seeing this beautiful, uh, beautiful Moran on the wall. Um, one last thing I would tell you is museums today are not going to survive if they can't be more than come see what's on the wall. Um, every one of you could pick up your phone and find a Thomas Moran to enjoy, <laughs> and so can children. Uh, and they can learn from that, and that's so much of their world, that digital journey. So how do we make history and art relevant to them in a way that is, speaks to them in ways that they will learn from it, but enjoy it, and be able to take away something more than, yeah, my fourth grade class went to Gilcrease Museum. So it's really, really important to me that we get this education wing built. It is what I think will be the last big transformational piece. I think Gilcrease Museum will be transformational for Northwest Tulsa. Uh, before a certain um, time in the 60s, I guess, after uh, busing, but before busing, um, about s nearly 60% of Tulsa lived in that part of the city. And it's just changed so much, and um, we need to make sure that uh, we offer something, not just to that community, but to all of Tulsa, that really repositions this museum as a cultural attraction and as a major tourist attraction. It has to give back to you and your families something on a, a regular diet of programming and opportunities that you can enjoy. It's your tax dollars that own it. So it has to provide something for Tulsans. Rather than just being this wonderful place that I've heard so many Tulsans say, oh, I have somebody in from out of town, so we're going to go to the Gilcrease. No, we have to have things that work for families and children and students and people of all ages every day. And so, the, yes, there will be a lot of technology in this building. There will be bike trails. There will be outdoor amenities. But we are going to be teaching people about the history and the culture of the Americas because that's what, museum, that's what this museum can do. And you should be very proud of it. And that's my story. Mayor Bynum is going to cut a ribbon on November uh, end of 2024 on something. I'm, I'm, he's, he's, he's really clear that he wants us finished uh, with the building by fall of 2024. So we can do that if there's not a lot of snow and rain and bad weather and uh, so forth. But we might have... Um, a hiccup on opening it to the public until May of 25. Because a building, before you can put fine art back in it, all of those chemicals, all of that build, those building materials, all of that has to off-gas before you can move everything back in. And we spent a good six months moving everything out, and we'll have to rewind that and move it back in. So maybe by mid-year or May of 2025. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Um, TU has managed Gilcrease since 2008. Um, we built the Helmrich TU sought funding for and built the Helmrich Center for American Research to house those archives. It's a really, de it's definitely a public-private partnership. It's public land, privately owned building, publicly owned collection inside, public and privately funded staff who work in it. It's a real amalgamation, uh, but, but as long as TU is managing the museum through that management agreement, it will continue to work with, with us. They've certainly been uh, restrained in their ability to do so over the last, I'd say, five years with all of higher ed's challenges. You know, those, but I think TU's really trying to make a, a good effort now. Yes, ma'am, I'll get you next. Absolutely. So the question was, have we considered powwows? Uh, because that's such a wonderful educational opportunity. Um, yes. And long ago, there were powwows on these grounds, I understand. And there is a wonderful festival field that is just perfect for that. So we're going to just make sure that it has um, access so that people can, can do that again. I think so. I think so. Yes, ma'am. In graphic storage, and something else was found in graphic storage, uh, which was a room in the basement. Um, that I, I think is just wonderful. And if, if you remember the old Gilcrease that was built in the 60s, there was a peyote bird above the entrance, and it was a woody crumbo. Um, we found that. It was in a great big box. They had peeled it off, and it, it needs to be conserved. But those tin boxes and the woody crumbo were just such gold mines to find. So it's in two different locations, and I know that when it's in the museum, we all know it's there at the museum, but the city has asked that we not share where the art is now because um, they're, yeah, yeah. They just worry about security. And I share that worry, so yeah. But it is safe. Is the parking garage part of the plan? No. Um, I wish it were. I think. You probably, if any of you are in construction, know that the cost of a parking garage is significant, and there's just that there's just not the money for it. So, surface parking. Yes, there will be some additional parking, and you don't see it cited yet. But I think the parking, how we're currently talking about it, is that it will be low and to the front, and uh, with a kind of a physical green barrier around it so that it's not oh, a sea of cement. And then there's the Brannon lot, which is just across the street. I see a question in the back? What are your fundraising efforts like? I mean, how are you raising all of the money? So in the last, well, TU has raised uh, money since it started managing Gilcrease. It raised money for the museum. In the last several years, that hasn't been able to be the case. Uh, hopefully it will be able sometime in the future. But I've just made appointments <laughs> with people and gone to them and talked to them. And so I have um, One Gas, Devon, One Oak, the Bernstein Foundation, the Williams Companies, uh, the George Kaiser Foundation, the Helmrich Foundation. Um, it's just a lot of private donations. But we need to go public with that campaign because people have asked, well, how can I help? So, you know, every little bit helps. <laughs> so those $5 contributions, those $20 contributions, those make a difference. So uh, this fall, we will probably go public with the campaign. 
Yes, ma'am. In the far ground, yeah. that is the Helmrich Center for American Research. It houses the archive that has about 200,000 documents. It has a digitization lab, which um, is a pretty, pretty much a glorified uh, uh, photography studio so that you can put it online. And it has a, a state-of-the-art conservation lab. That's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know that I said that they would be open. You didn't miss anything. I said it's our goal to begin construction on them this time next year, early fall or, or sometime in that range, uh, midsummer, early fall. And they, it will take a year to complete. The Thomas Gilcrease House itself is not open to the public. There is a little garden in front of the Thomas Gilcrease House, that beautiful little Victorian garden, and that is open. And people in the neighborhood come there with their lawn chairs and hang out almost every other night. I mean, it's... The Helmut Building is open for scholars, for research. Mm -hmm. They they make appointments uh, to visit the archive. I believe so. I mean, in because I've always been underwhelmed by his house when you think of the amount of money he's been spending. He was not the same. He was not the same like type of uh, individual as a maybe one of the Phillips brothers with building a Mediterranean villa. <laughs> he there's a quarry there on the property, and he just took the stones. And actually, that house was partially built when he bought it. Uh, a family by the name of Flowers owned it, and he just had it finished. And ensconced his wife, Norma Smallwood, Miss America, in it, in a very short-lived marriage. But you're right, it's, it's, it's not a fancy uh, place so, at all. Yes, sir? So it would have always been our hope that uh, we would have been adding square footage. So there would be a way to say, oh, you're going to see 10% more of this collection. Most museums never show more than 10% of what they have, but um, we wanted to be able to do that. With, the, with it moving from uh, expansion to new construction and so much of that money going into that building, um, and the square footage, you're, you're going to have a smaller footprint, but you're going to take care of that art. You're, it's, 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 not, it's going to be well taken care of, and you are going to see more of it um, because it is, it's going to have more wall space for it and more open storage. And so you will see more of it, but it's not going to be like 20,000 more square feet of, of, of museum. I mentioned you have a wonder woman. No. Anybody has built a home. Heck, I spent two hours building a doghouse. <laughs> so I, I can't imagine the magnitude uh, that's involved in this. And I can't think of a better person to uh, take this on. So we appreciate it. Uh, Thank you so much. And we hope you'll be uh, able to enjoy it. Oh, I hope you all will be able to enjoy it.